Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Emran Meyer. I'm a professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine in the departments of medicine, psychiatry, and physiology. And I'll be talking to you this morning about the mind-gut connection. You can ask questions throughout this webinar, and hopefully we'll get to some of them to be able to answer some of them at the end of my presentation. In the next 30 minutes or so, I will walk you through several points. I'll say a few words about the, uh, the basic um, knowledge, the basic facts about the gut microbiome. Um, I'll focus on how the gut microbes can communicate with the brain and vice versa. Um, then we'll touch briefly on some um, disorders that have emerged as brain-gut microbiome disorders, which is a relatively recent um, development. And then at the end, I'll say a few things about practical implications. What you can see on the left uh, side of the diagram, um, it's, a, it's a basic schematic of how the brain on top in the nervous system um, are, is connected to our digestive tract um, and the microbiome that live in it um, through various loops that the involves the immune system, the microbiome. Some of these pathways are directly, others are mediated through these, um, through these other systems. And then a very important note, how this brain-gut microbiome axis is intricately connected to the environment by two ways. One is the psychosocial influences that reach uh, us through the brain and the others are the um, influences that are mediated by diet, um, pathogens and antibiotic, and pesticides, many other things that uh, get into our digestive system and interact with the microbes. A few basic facts about the, the gut microbiome that may be of interest to you and if you may not heard about it. So the microbial cells that inhibit our bodies um, are about the same number of cells as our human cells. Um, and more importantly, their genes outnumber our human genes up to 400 folds. That means um, the 800,000 genes of the microbes um, are um, interacting with some 20,000 genes um, of our human bodies and interact in regulating uh, our basic physiology. Also, because of this vast gene pool, there is a, a vast number of um, molecules that the microbes are able to produce. These uh, metabolites, some of them are neuroactive, um, and they use these molecules to interact with each other, um, but also with us, their, their host. These microbes are invisible, that's why I really didn't know about this until very recently. Um, but if you put them all together into one place, they would um, equal in size the, the liver. And remarkably, all our medical textbooks are written without this forgotten organ. And, and finally, if you look at each other, we're pretty similar in terms of our human genes go. Uh, we're actually even very similar to our um, primate cousins. Um, but we're quite different based on the gut microbial genes. Um, it seems that there's only about 10% similarity from one person to another. So we're all very unique based on this large number of genes that we have carrying around with us inside of our GI tract. So how do the gut microbes talk to our brain? On the left side, you see what the basic functions of the gut microbes um, have been recognized. Um, so on top, probably one of the most important things, the ability to break down substances in our diet, resistant starch, complex carbohydrates, mainly from plant-based sources, that we don't have in our human GI tract the enzymes to break them down. So they would go through our small intestine, undigest it, get into the colon, the microbes there would then break them down, metabolize them, and turn them into either molecules that are absorbable and are a source of energy. So it's a mechanism of harvesting um, additional calories from a plant-based diet that normally otherwise we would lose. But more importantly for this conversation is the byproducts of this metabolism are also a vast number of molecules that can interact with many other cells in our body, and I'll show you this in a minute. So then there's other things, so um, um, lignans, these are substances again from, from plants, um, part of the group of polyphenol, uh, uh, polyphenols. Um, with significant health benefits, antioxidants. Uh, at the bottom, a very interesting function that they have, 
the breakdown or metabolism of xenobiotics. These are all chemicals that um, we are exposed to, but that um, the microbes have never encountered uh, during evolution. They were able to metabolize them, um, inactivate them or activate them into other metabolites um, by this wisdom that they have accumulated over a long period of time. So there's many other functions um, you can see on, on the left side. Now on the right side, this is really where it gets interesting beyond just uh, harvesting of calories. Um, it's really how these substances that are generated by the breakdown of um, the food sources of the microbes, mainly plant-based complex carbohydrates, how these, um, these metabolites then can reach other organs and organ systems, so the cardiovascular system, um, metabolism, immune system, um, and also for our discussion here, most importantly, the, the brain. From the beginning of this, um, um, of this new field, um, it's been a rapid evolution in our conceptualization of how the microbes communicate um, with the gut and with the brain. It's kind of summarized here. You see in the left uh, side the, the gut microbes the many molecules in the green box that they can produce. They can communicate with the nervous system directly. They can also communicate with many cells. This is a schematic of our gut wall with the various cell types that are present there, immune cells particularly. Uh, <clears throat> it's been referred to as the gut connectome because all these cells are interconnected. So the microbes can send signals to this, um, to the gut connectome, particularly to the gut-associated immune system. Um, and then these secondary signaling molecules, cytokines, other um, inflammatory uh, molecules, um, can then reach the, the brain again. You can also see that all these errors are bidirectional, so this is not a one-way street, but the brain can equally, uh, it's equally important, uh, can talk to the microbes and the various cells in the gut um, to influence microbial behavior. If you summarize this complex slide, you don't have to look at the details. You see the microbes on the left side. Um, you see the layer of gut cells, so-called epithelial cells, that separate the inside of the gut from the outside. And then you see all the immune cells. The biggest part of our immune system is located in the gut, the so-called gut-associated immune system. And these microbes have specific ways of how they can communicate with a variety of different immune cells and influence their behavior. The immune cells generate signals, shown here um, a lot of um, uh, cytokines that have been shown to affect the central nervous system, the, the brain. You can almost look at this as a neural network with an input layer and an output layer. And the input layer is something that, um, just like a neural network, that can be trained. And, and how is it trained? Uh, in early life, um, there's many factors, I'll show you this in a, in a minute, that can program the first three years of life where the system is very plastic, can program this neural network. And then once it's learned its basic operating um, mode, it will stay like this pretty much for the rest of our time. So an important factor are these early life events, um, which um, play a particular role during the first three years of life. And I'll give you a few examples of this. We've learned a lot from studies just in the last few years of which factors can influence the development of the um, gut microbiome. You can see things that happen during pregnancy, maternal infections, medications, maternal nutrition, very important factor, um, maternal stress. Environmental factors can both you know, affect the pregnant mother, but also the newborn. Then the mode of delivery, vaginal versus C-section, um, the quality and duration of breastfeeding, molecules in breast, in human breast milk that are specifically target at the gut microbes of the developing infant um, that are not absorbed by the infant's gut, but they just target the microbes and help to assemble them. Um, and then there's clearly the antibiotics again, so not just in the mother's side, but also um, the newborn first three years of life, um, a shocking number of antibiotic prescriptions are given to children and infants under three years of life for benign, um, generally upper respiratory infections or um, sinus infections. So all these factors play a role in programming 
this neural network that I showed you the, on the previous slides. So once it's programmed, what happens during our adult life? So the main, two main factors that play a role here. One is the diet. Um, it's a schematic of the um, Mediterranean diet, which is sort of like the ultimate diet for our gut microbes because it's about two-thirds of plant-based food, um, very little animal fat, a lot of um, polyphenols and antioxidants, which also um, feed the microbes. Um, <clears throat> and the other factor is clearly the, the, the brain, the central nervous system, that still, through these top-down influences, can modulate the um, this gut microbiome or the, the microbiome gut interface throughout life. So, for example, stress, uh, negative emotions, and diet, two major factors that probably play a role in, in the etiology and pathophysiology of many um, um, disorders that until recently had really been considered just brain disorders without thinking about the microbial input. I, I want to highlight one particular cell and one particular mechanism that is, is always um, um, makes a lot of people uh, realize there's something really important going on here. So these are the cells in green that um, store and produce 95% of our body's serotonin. Um, so serotonin, the target of um, psychiatric uh, drugs, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, Zoloft, um, and others. It's not in the brain, even though psychiatry targets these medications at the brain. The great majority is in the gut. Um, and the production, the synthesis of serotonin by enzymes that are in these cells are influenced to a large degree by signals from the microbes. So the, just imagine the microbes of our gut have a major word to say in how much serotonin we produce. Um, and that's important because, as you can see from this red um, pathway, which is a sensory nerve from the vagus nerve that forms a synapse with th these entrochromophene cells or these serotonin containing cells. So the more serotonin we have, the more we release it, the more signals reach um, the sy systems, circuits within the brain uh, that have to do with emotions and autonomic responses, stress responses, and, and, and so forth. Diet plays a big role because these microbes increase in number um, with an increased intake of tryptophan containing foods. So not just tryptophan supplements, which you know have been promoted as having a health benefit on mood stabilization and bowel habit uh, normalization, but also chocolate, um, nuts, cheese, um, and uh, many other uh, plant and animal uh, uh, proteins. And then on top of this, you can see the blue arrow. The blue arrow can is is a path, a nerve pathway, going back down to these cells, which can lead to the release of serotonin into the gut lumen, um, which then affects again the behavior of the microbes. So we are completely linked with the microbes in our gut through these with this cell type that contains the serotonin, and that system is influenced by what we eat to a large degree. Particularly important because that substance, uh, serotonin, is a ubiquitous regulator of many vital functions from sleep, appetite, well-being, pain sensitivity, um, um, and uh, obviously mood. Another aspect of diet, and that um, has kind of made it already into the lay public, um, may have be even be talked about in the lay public before science and traditional medicine has taken over this idea. So this is an interface of the, um, the gut layer, again, inside of the gut, the outside. You can see there's a, a barrier between the inside and the outside, which is composed of a mucus layer that's produced by the gut cells, um, and also by this tightness of connections between the cells that um, produces a barrier to, um, intestinal um, um, epithelial barrier. This is a healthy diet, high in undigestible carbohydrates, mainly from plant sources, pre and probiotics, um, symbiotics combined combination of these two. Um, and one particular organism, this Acamansia mucinophilia, which is the organism that stimulates the gut to produce the mucus. So there's certain microbes that make our gut layer tighter 
And if they're deficient, obviously the, the gut becomes leakier. So what happens with a um, bad diet that's high in animal fat, low in plant-based foods and uh, mainly the carbohydrates, you see that the mucus layer had shrunk um, to almost being non-existent and the barriers between the cell types has increased. So these two factors uh, lead, lead to this greatly compromised gut barrier, um, which is referred to as the leaky gut. Now what happens is that um, uh, immunogenic uh, components of bacteria, but also um, food components, um, antigens from, from different aspects of food, have access to the immune system, which is located here, inducing this low-grade inflammatory state. And then this inflammation is not just limited to, doesn't remain limited in the gut, but it gets into the systemic circulation, producing a state that has been referred to as metabolic toxemia. So toxemia is something that we have. We have an infection that becomes systemic. Um, this, this kind of state can be induced just by the unhealthy diet. That's why it has been referred to as inflammatory diets that many components of the North American diet um, um, have. And if you look at traditional diets or the Mediterranean diet, they do not produce the same. They really keep you in a state like this. Now, this metabolic endotoxemia, these inflammatory molecules can reach the fat tissue um, and also for our interest, particularly important, the, the, the brain. And this low-grade inflammation of the brain has been implicated in some forms of depression, um, um, food sensitivities, and also the um, uninhibited eating, which has been um, also referred to as food addiction, a main cause of uh, obesity. So we talked a little bit about how the microbes have the ability to communicate to talk to our brain in pretty dramatic ways. Hopefully I convinced you of this. Um, now the other way around, it's equally important um, because everything that happens in the brain, every emotion, particularly negative emotions and stress will go down to the gut um, and change things there. You don't have to look at these in details. A large number of gut functions are under the control of the so-called autonomic nervous system, um, which, just if you look at the first one, the contractions of the gut in different regions and the transit time greatly affected. Uh, each emotion has sort of a unique state of um, uh, motility patterns in, from the esophagus all the way to the end of the large intestine. That changes the environment of the microbes and their function. So just imagine every time you have a negative emotion or you're chronically stressed, you will change the environment the microbes live in and what they do and what they produce. Now, in response to these factors that change the environment where the microbes live in, there's also um, this fascinating effect of direct stress-induced modulation of the microbial behavior um, illustrated here. So... When you're stressed, norepinephrine is one of those. It's cortisol, norepinephrine that go up. Norepinephrine is the one that the, the, the molecule that drives up your heart rate, your blood pressure, makes you sweaty. Um, but it also it doesn't just stay in our bodies. It leaks into the inside of the gut. So you see this norepinephrine signal, and it interacts with um, receptors that are unique, specific for this molecule. So the microbes have the same receptors as we have. Um, and what it does, it changes the microbes gene expression and their behavior. They become more aggressive um, and can turn uh, from a sort of a beneficial role um, into an aggressive role uh, towards us, the, uh, the, the host's intestinal wall. So next time you get stressed um, or have a, a very or angry or um, upset about something, always think about it. You will do something to your microbes, which is not good for either them or for our own health. So after this brief overview, let me just go through through a couple of disorders, and this will be brief. It's I, I also have to warn you, this is a rapidly evolving area. I think if I gave this presentation in five years from now, it would sound possibly quite different. Um, but just to, to, to show you how this field is and what direction is it's moving, I'm just going to talk about three areas, depression, obesity, 
and um, irritable bowel syndrome. And there's many others that um, were equally exciting uh, facts have been emerging and people are working on um, uh, not only elucidating the mechanisms of how this works, but also identifying potential uh, therapy targets. Um, because as you know, in many of these areas, um, the traditional pharmaceutical approach has not been particularly successful. So let's start with mood and affect. Um, this area started with the, this interest started with sort of the uh, pioneering observations um, from a group in, um, at McMaster University in Canada. So when investigators transplanted the fecal material from a mouse that had a more, we could say, um, introvert um, a behavior, less aggressive, into a mouse that doesn't have, uh, didn't have its own gut microbes, the so-called germ-free mouse, um, this mouse adopted the same behavior as the donor mouse, um, simply by transferring the foods, uh, the, the, the stool. So that clearly indicates there's something in the fecal material produced by the microbes that can get to the brain and change the behavior of these mice. Now, after the first experiments, this has been extrapolated immediately to humans. Um, I can assure you so far, there's no evidence that this actually works in humans, particularly because we are not in a state like in this germ-free state that you can recolonize or start a new gut microbiome. Um, we have our own. If you add something else to it, it will not um, be able to really change the, the composition of, of our own uh, gut microbiome. But it, it proves the principle that microbes have the ability to talk to the brain. In the meantime, um, four studies have been published just in the last couple of years um, in um, human populations, looking at the fecal material, um, and you can see the this is a so-called principal component analysis, just showing you the separation simply based on the microbial composition of the stool. Uh, you can see that the, in red, the patients with um, major depressive disorder um, were separate almost completely from the blue ones, which are the healthy controls. So even if you didn't know the diagnosis, you could just tell from the sign if this individual is depressed or, or not depressed. Um, this is just a display of the, the changes in the individual taxa. Um, and, and you can see that the color coding, the distribution of colors um, in the depressed uh, individuals is different from the control animals. There's more red, there's more pink um, um, here, and there's more blue on, on, uh, on the healthy controls. So I won't have the time to get into more details of this. But what these investigators also did, they took stool samples from these depressed patients that they had characterized based on their gut microbiome and transplanted them into these germ-free mice. And the mice um, developed depression-like behavior. So again, this trait can be transplanted from humans into these mice that don't have their own microbes. Um, and then when they looked at the, the microbial composition of the mice, the ones that received the stool samples from the depressed subjects were completely separate from the, one, from the ones that received control samples from the healthy controls. So this is something, uh, a unique feature of the microbes in terms of their, um, which um, taxa are present in the microbiome. Um, this is also shown here on this, on this, um, uh, um, on this heat plot, on this heat map, um, that there was a significant difference between the microbial composition organisms between those two groups that had received the, the transplant. There, there's, um, I should say there's several other um, publications that have come out that more or less confirm the same principle. So we have a total of four publications in the last two years. I would say that's pretty strong evidence um, that certainly there's an association between altered gut microbiota and metabolites and um, major depressive disorder, if it's causative, and I'll come back to this in just a moment, or if it's just an association, we don't know the full answer uh, um, to that question. Interestingly, there's also has been a, a, a controlled clinical trial with um, where um, patients with major depressive disorders underwent traditional therapy, um, but one group were ingesting a their regular diet, or the other group. Um, also um, was switched to a Mediterranean diet. 
um, and the group that received the combined Mediterranean diet plus traditional um, antidepressive therapy did significantly better in outcomes than the one that pursued their regular diet. It's just the beginning of a new field in psychiatry where dietary um, um, therapies will be used almost certainly as an adjunct to traditional psychiatric therapy. So let me summarize at this early stage, so obviously risky, five years from now this model may disappear. I, don't quite believe so. If you look at psychiatry, we know a lot about the genetic predisposition. We know that stress, chronic stress, early adverse life events or trauma in predisposed individuals um, are an important trigger for the first onset development of depression. We know that this output from the brain, as I talked to you earlier, um, from the emotional centers in the brain to the gut changes the, um, the gut connectome. So we have a state of Dysbiosis change of the, the microbes, shown you on the previous slide. Um, there's an increased leakiness of the gut through the sympathetic nervous system. And there is immune activation, um, possibly it's metabolic toxemia. Then what the microbes, the alter microbes produce are these um, neuroactive uh, metabolites, so breakdown products that are similar to some of our neurotransmitters, which can go to the brain. Um, either through the bloodstream or through the vagus nerve, uh, and also immune mediators, which then um, reach the brain and can reinforce um, the characteristic changes that we see in patients with chronic depression, behavioral inhibition, anhedonia, and um, increased stress reactivity. As you'll see, because I show you a couple more of these models, I think this is a prototypic way of understanding the brain-gut microbiome axis and how it play, how this circular interaction plays a role um, in um, many chronic diseases. Let's switch to another disorder, something that has is um, present in epidemic proportions all around the world. Sadly, it's coexisting with um, millions of people um, starving to death. So the, the world has sort of been broken down in an obesity problem and a starvation um, problem. There's, there's many factors that contribute to obesity. I want to focus on one um, part of it, that, which regulates ingestive behavior that drives us to seek out food, um, which is abundant in our environment, um, and that um, um, plays a big role in patients eating way above their metabolic needs. So again, the classic experiment was um, a genetically modified mouse that has, is obese and um, overeats. If you take the fecal material, put them into this germ-free mouse, um, then this mouse becomes, develops the same phenotype as the, um, the donor mouse. It becomes obese. And the most important thing is it becomes obese because it has no inhibition to eat as long as you provide the food. So something was transferred by the, micro by the microbes that regulates um, or dysregulates ingestive behavior. There's quite a bit of evidence now to support the model I'm gonna show you. Again, genetic pre pre predisposition. Um, this disorder of uncontrolled food intake has also been called food addiction because many of the same mechanisms that have been described in substance abuse um, have also been identified in individuals that have this um, um, type of eating disorder. Genetic predisposition, um, when this is combined, when this individual comes into an environment of unlimited, abundant, cheap, high caloric food, as our North American environment is at the moment, um, then there's a diet induced change in the gut uh, connectome. The, the gut microbes change, we know this, many studies. And there's also a change in many cells in this gut connectome, for example, the sensitivity of vagal fibers that sense the amount of calories that, and the amount of fat that's in, that, that we have ingested. Um, they're desensitized, so there's no longer the same satiety signals that reach, reach the brain. These diet induced alterations in the gut and its microbiome, um, again, similar to depression, will generate um, these neuroactive metabolites, 
um, the state of metabolic toxemia, low-grade inflammation we talked about earlier, um, and uh, 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 reduced satiety signals that are um, released less effectively. This goes back into the brain. Some of these signals go back to the brain um, and lead to a disinhibition of the reward system, which then contributes or exacerbates um, this craving for high caloric food. It's particularly the high sugar and the high fat food in the diet that induces these changes that lead to this vicious um, cycle. The last example, um, functional gastrointestinal disorder, disorders with IBS being the most prominent example. Um, just going to show you the model. Again, similar. In this case, the predisposing um, alterations are this increased stress reactivity, anxiety, and uh, increased sensory perception that we think precedes is present in, um, in young children that later develop uh, functional disorders. Alterations that are associated with this signals down to the gut. S same um, situation as I mentioned before, altering the gut microbial composition, the metabolites, um, which then signal back to the brain and reinforce the, the cycle. It's, it's interesting, so it's the same model, but the trigger mechanisms are different. So in depression, we think it's um, there's a predisposition in the brain. Stress plays a major role in uh, triggering the onset. Um, so it starts centrally, but then it involves the in entire loop. Um, with obesity, there's also predisposition at the brain level, but the main trigger is the abundance um, of cheap, high caloric food that alters the microbiome and then sets up. So the system can be altered both at the brain level, at the gut level, but ultimately they come out based on your genetic predisposition with different disorders. So concluding, hopefully I was able in this short period of time to convince you of a few fundamental facts. The brain-gut microbiome axis is a fully integrated system which is programmed early in life. So the the operating system is established early on. Uh, in other words, you could say that the, the orchestra players uh, are hired early on in life in the first three years. And then, but then the orchestra throughout life can play different, um, um, different tunes and different pieces, different symphonies, depending on what you tell them, which is in this case is the food that we feed them. The, Despite the early programming, the communication within this brain gut microbiome axis is modulated throughout life through diet, medication, and, and stress, which then gives us three targets for um, possible interventions. This concept five or 10 years ago would have been unthinkable that alterations in this communication system appear to play a modulatory role in several brain disorders, including depression, obesity, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, but the, this list is much larger. Parkinson's disease is another one that nobody would have thought 10 years ago that um, the first changes actually occur in the gut. As I mentioned, the dysregulation, this is no longer if a disorder starts at the brain or in the, in, at the gut. Once it's established, it will involve the entire circuitry um, and therapeutic approaches, ideally, uh, to interrupt this, um, these vicious cycles, should be targeted at the brain, like with um, mind-based therapies and centrally acting pharmacology, um, but also at the same time at the gut level with diet um, and paying more attention to, for example, the intake of, of medications such as um, unnecessary antibiotics. And um, Novel, the novel treatment strategies for brain disorders are likely, as I mentioned, likely to include microbiome-related targets and mechanisms. There's a, a tremendous effort by the biotech industry, many startup companies, in identifying these metabolites, these signal molecules that the microbes produce. Remember, um, a vast number of um, genes and a vast number of molecules that they can produce. Um, this is an um, unprecedented um, wealth of, of molecules for the pharmaceutical industry 
to identify some that may have beneficial effects either to block them uh, or to enhance them. Um, and there's many ways that um, industry is beginning to uh, target this. So I've come to the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And this is the time um, where I'm going to be looking at some questions that you have sent in during the presentation. And we'll try to answer some of them. I won't be able to do it for all of them. So uh, the first question, I would say this is of the many talks I've been giving to promote my, my book, is um, number one here, how do I choose a probiotic for gut health? Very difficult question to answer. Um, as all of you know that have been in a situation, there is an unlimited number of um, probiotics recommended, either singular organisms or combinations um, in very high uh, quantity, uh, it's measured by you know, billions of uh, organisms. 95%, 99% of these have never been uh, evaluated, tested in randomized controlled clinical trials, like any drug would have to be tested. Um, a few of them have. As, um, um, you know, the complement has to go to a few companies who have gone through the expense of testing it. I think what we can say is that there's definitely a, a small but significant health benefit of taking Probiotics, we don't know for sure which ones are better than others um, because they're, they're not being evaluated. Um, my recommendation is there's not just probiotics in pill form. Um, there's many fermented foods. Um, most um, dietary traditions around the world, um, from Asia to Europe, Russia, um, have had fermented foods as a, a main a staple food of, of their diets. Uh, can be dairy products, um, but can also be plant-based. So the Korean um, uh, uh, kimchi, uh, kombucha, fermented tea, cheeses, a very rich source of a, a, a high variety of um, microbes that uh, some scientists are actually characterizing. It depends on how how aged the, the, the cheese is, what type of cheese it is, if it's pasteurized or, or not. Um, Certainly in, in countries with a high cheese consumption, uh, like in France or the Netherlands, or um, um, that is almost certainly a rich source of, of microbes. We don't know if they are, provide any health benefits, so we can't really call them probiotics. Um, but the, the short answer is um, enrich your regular diet with fermented foods, um, and um, including fermented dairy. Um, and don't try to figure out which ones of the untested uh, or unsubstantiated claims of many marketed products uh, is, is better for you. Okay. So what is the treatment for, for gut stress? Um, so just remember... It's not just gut stress, it's an engagement of the entire brain-gut microbiome axis. So um, if you talk just about gut stress, it's the antibiotics, it's the infect the gastroenteric infections, it's the diet. So the answer is easy, um, avoid unnecessary um, intake of probiotics. So every time we have a severe cold, it is a viral um, disease. It, a, a cold, um, and it will not get better with, with antibiotics, even though you may feel that way through a placebo effect. Um, that should be avoided, not just for you, but also for your, particularly for your children of um, uh, ear infections, sinus infections. Um, they should not get the antibiotic for those infections. Um, the other one, um, start a healthy diet. Um, this is not something that if you like a fat diet that changes every year. We know from an extensive number of studies now that um, a diet high in plant-based foods like traditional Asian diets or the, um, the classic Mediterranean diet have a health benefit and decrease um, stress, the gut stress. Somebody asked um, that he or she is suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Which diet should I follow? A good question. Until recently, that has not really been addressed scientifically. There's now a renewed interest um, um, 
by organizations such as the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation um, or also the NIH in evaluating, for example, the, the, the benefit of the Mediterranean diet. There's several clinical trials going on on the outcome of Crohn's disease. It's probably a question of um, what stage you're in. Do you want to use this diet as a prophylactic um, a treatment because we know it's an it is an anti-inflammatory diet, um, or are you thinking about treating a flare of IBD um, with diet, which I think is probably much less effective um, and would require different kinds of approaches. But in terms of prophylactic, um, just remember the the high plant-based diet has fosters the abundance of organisms such as this mucus-stimulating organism, acamantia, um, which increase the mucus layer of the gut, improves the, the barrier of the gut, and therefore should have a beneficial role um, in, the, in the prevention of uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, flares. However, the scientific answer for this, uh, you'll have to wait for the outcome of ongoing studies. Another question here, um, I have received many antibiotics as a child. Do I need to restore a normal diversity of gut microbiomes. Our current thinking is, um, and this is kind of a sad state, um, if you look at the, the gut microbial um, diversity and abundance in people living in North American cities, and if you compare this, for example, to uh, native people living on the, in the South American rainforest, um, the diversity has decreased by about 40% of, of microbes. This is a process that has been going on for the last 40, 50 years and is continuing. Just like the diversity of the rainforest itself is dramatically going down, this is reflected inside our gut e ecological system as well. Um, also remember, I, I said that the um, original programming happens early in life. This decreased diversity was, was also seen in infants in North American cities. So um, is there a way to reverse the process? Um, there's pretty good evidence that you're able to counteract this to certain degrees. Um, you will not change the major um, architecture of your gut microbiome, but you can increase or change the relative abundances of the good bacteria as opposed to um, either the presence of um, bacteria with negative effects or just the, the shortage of, for example, these mucus producing organisms. So yes, certainly going, even if you got the antibiotics, um, you will not change what happened early on, um, but you can change, you can enhance the functionality of the microbiome as an adult through dietary means. I should also say, you know, stress has, and mind states, negative mind states, has a very negative effect, um, as hopefully it could convince you, on gut microbial health as well, and gut health. So it's not just a diet, you always have to think about it uh, to target or restore the gut microbiome axis, but from both, um, from both ends, the, the brain, the mind, and, and the gut. What do you recommend to detox my gut, to no alcohol or fry food? Um, so this term detoxification is very popular. It's been popular for thousands of years. You can go back in literature. Many indigenous tribes have detoxification rituals, not just for the gut, but in general. So I, I think humans like the idea of detoxification, um, reaching a more pure state, um, you know, which is presumed to be healthier. We can't really say that. I mean, it's not, um, yes, if you have been eating a unhealthy diet and have been doing all the wrong things all along, switching to the healthy diet um, will definitely have the benefit, which I just talked about, restoring some of the problems. Um, alcohol, red wine, in, so the question was alcohol, fried food. Yes, fried foods are um, some of the worst offenders um, because not only are they fatty, it's animal-based um, um, fat, and it's, it's also lots of carbohydrates like with uh, French fries. 
alcohol is sort of a, um, can give a definitive answer because red wine contains many of these polyphenols, these health promoting substances coming from the skin of the grapes that um, are partly taken up by the microbes, are food for the microbes, and stimulate the microbes to have a um, anti-inflammatory effect on our gut. So red wine in small amounts, definitely good. Um, but these other things that have been become popular, like juicing, for example, it's probably the worst thing that you can do for your gut microbial health because you take out all the fibers um, that you, you press the juice, you take out the fibers, you take out the skin and many of the parts of the fruit and the vegetables and the berries that um, have these high concentrations of health benefiting polyphenols. So detoxing with uh, juicing, not a good idea. Um, fasting, different story. Fasting, intermittent fasting, probably a good thing. Again, has been around um, for thousands of years in different uh, cultures. Um, we don't know exactly what happens to the microbial composition, but we do know um, it switches, fasting switches your gut to a pattern that um, is cleansing the gut through a powerful wave of contractions that goes through every 90 minutes and, you know, cleans out microbes from places where they're not supposed to be, like in the upper small intestine. How does one effectively listen to the gut, take breaks, meditation? Um, I, as, as I've described in my, in, in my book, there's various ways of doing this. We're, in generally, most parents will not necessarily teach their children to listen to their gut, but often um, train them to think rationally like everybody else does in, a, in, in school, what the textbooks say, what social norms say. Um, some individuals have this pretty, and without being sexist, I think women have a greater ability to listen to their gut um, and are better in touch because of this with their emotions as, as men are. Um, there's ways like um, mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction, abdominal breathing, where you focus your attention on the abdomen. Um, the abdomen in many traditional cultures also, with the traditional Chinese and Korean uh, teachings, is, is a central organ of central site of strength uh, and power in, in the body. So doing abdominal breathing that focuses on this uh, peri-umbilical uh, area um, will help you do this. Um, and I also mentioned in my book things like, um, for some people, um, even something like psychoanalysis may get people more in touch with that part of them, them themselves, this intuitive, um, um, you know, Gut feeling based aspect of their of their personality of, and and of their being. Even though we don't train our children to do this, um, most people, if you listen in the in the media, it's almost daily. Some note that somebody made a decision um, based on their gut feelings. Um, so it's a very common thing that people will resort once it's a very important decision. Um, to go back to this sort of um, very basic mechanisms, not thinking about making plus minus decisions in their head, but really listening to their gut. So I can tell you this in a couple of minutes, but clearly it is possible. Um, easiest done from the beginning on, education of your children. Later, there's various techniques that you can um, train yourself to do that. So I think I have, um, do we have any other questions? Good. Um, so we've, we've come to the end of this webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and you learned some things for your own health. Um, clearly there's a lot more to learn. Um, there's now, there are now many books out. Um, the mind gut connection focuses particularly on um, the brain, the mind, and the gut uh, microbes. There's many other books on the microbiome coming out. <clears throat> Um, and um, hopefully some of these um, discussions that we had and the, the facts that I presented will help you to um, first look at your own, the way you treat your gut microbiome, um, and hopefully then also will lead to uh, changes in your eating habits, um, the way you look at the importance of both 
mind-based factors and dietary factors in reaching a state of optimal health. Thank you very much for your attention.